Hello, and welcome to lecture 13. So this is the second to last lecture. Uh, don't forget to do your quiz. It's due, I'm assuming you're watching this on Wednesday. So it would be due at midnight on Wednesday. Anyway, brief, re brief review from last lecture. So we talked about uh, the types of shear in supercells. So we talked about how sheets sorry, <laughs> speed shear results in these splitting storms, um, which you can have in a cold front. You can have it really in anything, the speed shear. Uh, so you have storms that form because the winds are moving faster aloft. Um, yeah, but what happens with this speed shear is it just results in these storms being split into two rather than forming into one large supercell. With directional shear, you have less of a chance of splitting, and it's typically associated with these weaker lifting mechanisms, so you have uh, fewer storms. So, supercell formation really relies on a balance of a lot of variables, including... Um, the shear and lift, so you don't want too much lift, um, but you don't want too much speed shear, you want more of a uh, directional shear. You don't really want too much of a good thing in a supercell. I would say that storm relative helicity, which is the same thing as directional shear, in the direction that creates tornadoes, that's like one thing that you can have a lot of. But CAPE, which is a good measure of lift, uh, so convective available potential energy, you really want like medium CAPE for good supercells. Tornadoes. Okay, we'll talk more about tornadoes. I think we're going to get some into the climatology today. So a tornado, this is a uh, we talked about supercells, which are, you don't need a tornado to form for a supercell to be classified as one, but supercells can form tornadoes. So a tornado is a violent, violently rotating column of air that is in contact with both the cloud and the ground. So the tornado may or may not be visible to the eye, so um, it doesn't necessarily have to have a visible funnel. Um, it just has to have visible dust or debris spinning up off the ground, and it also needs to be connected to the cloud base. So the funnel, whether it's visible or not, that is not in contact with the ground is not a tornado. So tornado on the ground is redundant. A tornado is always on the ground. Like, if you have a funnel but it's not touching the ground yet, it's still a mesocyclone. It's a mesocyclone until the point that that funnel hits the ground. Only 1% of storms produce tornadoes. Um, here's some averages. So the average wind speed is about 100 miles per hour. So stronger than a category one hurricane. Um, the diameter is about 150 feet to half a mile. Um, the lifespan is on average 10 minutes, but of course they can last a long longer and they can also be cyclic, meaning that the tornado touches down on the ground, moves some distance, lifts and then touches back down on the ground again later. The typical forward speed of a tornado, so the whole relative storm motion, is about 30 miles per hour and the distance they typically cover is four to five miles. So let's talk about some extremes. So the strongest wind speeds ever recorded in a tornado were the May 3rd 1999 tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. Um, where the wind speed hit 318 miles per hour. And this was actually the strongest recorded winds on planet Earth. And it's also like, like what, like 10, 15 miles away from here? Like, that's kind of awesome. That's really cool. Of course, there, there may have been stronger uh, winds on Earth in history, but this is the strongest winds we've recorded. Uh, the, the longest damage path, um, is attributed to the March 18, 1935 tri-state tornado across Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. So this was anywhere between 151 and 235 miles, but uh, there were some disputes. This is also the deadliest tornado on record. 797 people uh, passed away in the storm. Uh, 
1935 was a while ago and we didn't have the same technology that we do have now to look at and uh, predict tornadoes as well as communicate that to people. So, and the building structures were not as good back then. So it makes sense that more people would uh, pass away from a tornado that par far in the past. The greatest pressure drop um, in a tornadic event was 100 millibars, which is pretty extreme. Uh, so on June 24th, 2003 in Manchester, South Dakota, uh, the pressure at the surface dropped to 850. Okay. That's insane. So this was the, uh, lowest recorded, uh, surface pressure on earth. I'm assuming that this is like with regards to height because I mean, at the top of, uh, Mount Everest, I'm pretty sure the pressure is lower than that. Anyway, 850 is the lowest recorded surface pressure on Earth uh, with regards to, like, sea surface. Anyway, the widest tornado was the May 31st, 2013 tornado in El Reno. Uh, it was 2.6 miles wide. Uh, you may or may not have heard of it, but there is a memorial for the storm chasers that died in that storm. Uh, it's called the Twist X Memorial. It's in El Reno, and you can see where that storm went across the field. And they have a memorial up with stuff from the vehicle uh, in the location that the vehicle was hit by the tornado. So that storm was massive. I can't, like, I can't even think of how long 2.6 miles wide is in my head. Like, my brain can't comprehend that. But, I mean, it's like you gotta see it to believe it. Which, there are videos of that on YouTube. Um, plenty of them. So, people went outside and recorded that. If I, I think if I saw that, like, a 2.6 mile wide tornado, I would just leave. I don't know if I would chase something like that. Like, that's insane. Okay. Uh, the largest tornado outbreak, uh, this is, this one kind of hits home for me. This was from April 25th to 28th in 2011. Um, this was the group of tornado produ tornadoes produced by a single mid-latitude wave cyclone. So in four days, there were 362 tornadoes. And, like, it was insane. Like, I, my family lives in Huntsville, Alabama. Well, they just moved, but they lived there for, like, the span of five years. And, um, on this day, April 27th, 2011, there was, like, 90 tornado warnings in, like, one hour in Huntsville. Like, it's insane. And my sister goes to school in Tuscaloosa. She recently graduated, but she, like, lives in Tuscaloosa. She, her school... I think actually the Tuscaloosa one was in 2014, but they got, I think they got hit by an EF4 in this event, but they got hit by an EF5 in a different event. Anyway, this day there was 11 EF4 tornadoes and five EF5 tornadoes, which I mean, we haven't had another EF5 tornado since like 2013 in the United States. So to have five EF5 tornadoes in one day is like seriously extreme. We usually like only have like one or two EF4 tornadoes per year, if that. So, like, this event was incredible and it had a huge human impact. So, there were 348 tornado related deaths, which is a very high number. Usually, you don't see that many deaths associated with a tornado um, or a tornado event uh, because tornadoes don't really hit that much of an area. Um, there was $11 billion in damages, uh, I'm assuming that's not adjusted for inflation, but anyway, you can see, like, uh, this is a little bit north of, like, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, so up through there, this is the Jackson region, uh, this is Tuscaloosa, and then Huntsville, Alabama, so this is the place where I used to live that had 90 tornado warnings in one hour, um, and like uh, through Atlanta area, and then you get more wind warnings up through Kentucky. There's some tornadoes in uh, Tennessee. There's some in Arkansas even. Uh, and then you get one single one in Indiana and one in uh, Ohio, and then several in these states up the eastern seaboard all the way up to New York, you are getting tornadoes. So this is just one day. One day you get all of these like that is just insane 292 
That's incredible. This was a very busy day at the Storm Prediction Center. That's what I was told by people who worked there. They, like, did not go home. Like, they were glued to their seats predicting these. Like, it was a very tough day to be predicting storms because it's just so extreme. Global tornadoes. So, uh, a combination of geography and meteorology causes the U.S. to have the most tornadoes of any country, and also the fact that we have more radars than any country. So, the United States receives about 1,200 tornadoes a year, and the second place is Canada, which gets about 100 tornadoes a year. Uh, this is the risk around the globe. So, yeah, you can see the United States is the highest, but, I mean... You know, this area over here, like in the Bangladesh, India area also gets tornadoes too, but they don't have the same radar data that we do. Like we have a freaking WSD, WS88D, WSD, yeah, WS88D. We have like multiple in every state. So we can pretty much see everything that happens, and there are people that just chase storms as a hobby here. So there will be more tornadoes on record per year in the United States than any other country. However, the United States is oriented very perfectly for tornado formation, especially the eastern half, because you get these winds coming over the Rocky Mountains. The Rocky Mountains helps generate that vorticity that's needed to form those storms, because as the wind moves off of the Rocky Mountains, like we were talking about last lecture, it causes stretching, so that's good for that storm formation, and then you have the different air masses that meet up. So all of those are great ingredients for forming severe weather that you don't really see in other places around the world. So the United States really is just like the sweet spot. So in the United States, each of the 50 states has uh, experienced a tornado. This, this is from 19, 1998 to 1999, um, where it says the average number of tornadoes per year is highest in Oklahoma. Um, I wish, but ever since I moved here, it seems like that's not the case anymore. I left Mississippi and like all of the tornadoes are in Mississippi now. Anyway, the state with the most tornadoes is Texas. Texas is huge. Yeah, um, the state with the most tornadoes per unit area is Florida, just because of how many storms they get, but, I mean, this is from 1991 to 2010, so you have to take that with a grain of salt, because that's only, like, 19 years of climatology data. I've been told that Hattiesburg, Mississippi is the city with the most tornadoes per unit area, which I would believe, because we went under tornado warning like several times a day like several times a week for months and it would start in like December and then it would continue uh through the spring so it says that there's not as many here but I I like it really makes me question anyway yeah Florida gets a lot of water spouts Florida can get a lot of like tornadoes forming from hurricanes as well but um yeah Florida does have relatively weaker tornadoes compared to other places there have been some strong tornadoes up in the Florida panhandle uh but you know I lived in Florida for a while and you know we didn't really get any tornadoes that like not tornadoes like we got in Mississippi or tornadoes we get here Tornadoes occur in every month of the year, but they're most common in April through July, depending on where you live. So, uh, different regions in the U.S. have different tornado seasons. Uh, so you can see, like, this is the 50 line, and then, dang, so it's like 275 tornadoes in May, and then it decreases. When I lived in Hattiesburg in January, it was like January 7th, January 18th, January that area so it was 2000 it was 2017 uh near the end of january and we got this terrible 
I it was either EF2 or EF3. I think it might have been EF2, but I've never seen like damage like that. We had a different school in our city uh, named William Carey University, and that school just got absolutely flattened. And all of their students had to live in hotels and come to class at our school because uh, it was just like such extreme damage. And just like on the way to work, just all of the uh, trees were snapped in half and buildings without roofs like I have not seen tornado damage like that in my life and I really started taking tornadoes seriously after seeing that and it happened in January like I was not really expecting that to happen in January but you know I guess in like Mississippi uh you kind of always have that warm air to uh get tornadoes going so yeah in the southeast uh the peak season is February to May and Tornadoes occur throughout the year here. Yeah, so that's like what I was saying. So I, Hattie, Hattiesburg is like here. So yeah, you're always on the Gulf. So you always have that Gulf moisture. So if you get a cold front coming through, you can get severe weather. But in the Great Plains, the peak season is from April, April to July. And the July is like up in the Northern Plains. Like we're not getting a tornado here. Here's an animation. I'm going to click on it. Okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, so October, November. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Hello. Okay, so. Sorry, I'm like kind of spoiling it, but I'm going back in time. Wait. My bad. Okay, anyway. So this is March. This is like March. So good chance in the south. And then as we move closer to April, the chances go up uh, in Oklahoma and end of April. Yep, and we're getting up. And then our tornado month is May. And then June, you can see that the probability meanders towards the north. July, it's up in Canada now. You, They don't have that. But yeah, it's up in Canada. So you can see very slim tornado chances uh, in September because it's just hot everywhere. You don't get that boundary, even in October. But the risk comes back in the south a little bit. Yeah, so November, we got some tornadoes in November in Mississippi. So this is around where I lived. Uh, we would get November and December as well. But January again and February. And yeah, so the tornado season is like much more persistent down in the south, but it's like more uh, intense in this Oklahoma area, at least until I moved here. Like the second I moved here to chase storms, uh, suddenly it's not anymore, whatever. Okay, um, time of day. So across the U.S., tornadoes predominantly occur, occur between 3 and 8 p.m. local time. Why? The ground is the warmest. Not necessarily. <laughs> so there are regional differences in what time tornadoes most often occur. Yeah, so like in Oklahoma, it's most likely to occur in the afternoon to early evening, like the tornadoes. In Mississippi, the tornadoes like to happen at like 3 to 4 a.m. And we're like in the laundry room at 3 a.m. And it's like, okay, we've done this like three times tonight. Like, can we please go to bed? <laughs> anyway, so yeah. Uh, southeast, so 2 to 8 p.m. local time. No. N no. <laughs> Maybe in the southeast, like Georgia, like the next day. So normally it's like the Great Plains. Like, it go it's in the Great Plains, right? And it's in, like, the afternoon. And then it goes over to the south. And then you get, like, these tornadoes that were in Oklahoma. Now they're in the south and they're forming at night. And then when you go over to Atlanta and areas in the eastern seaboard, it's, like, the next day. So I disagree based on... Um, based on personal experience. But you will have professional, I answered this on a test and my professor, this was in uh, Dr. Gularno's class. 
I said that the tornadoes happen later in the southeast than in the Great Plains, and I got it wrong, and then I went to his office hours, and I was like, sir, like, every tornado that we had happened at, like, 1 to 2 a.m., like, from... It would happen from, like, 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. Sometimes you would get them in the daytime, too, but a lot of them were nocturnal. And he gave me credit back, and he said, well, I can't deny your experience that you had. So, anyway, this is some data from, this is from 1950 to 2010. So, yeah, it does say that it happens earlier in the day here, but I guess in recent time... In recent times, things have changed. So, yeah, I guess there are more, look, like, if you look at it, like, look at the concentration. So the concentration of afternoon storms in uh, Tornado Alley, which is where we live, it's much higher. But the distribution is much more even in uh, Dixie Alley. So, you know, the chances of a tornado happening later at night are much higher. Anyway, I'm not going to ask you this question on a quiz because I think that it's like a loaded question because it really just depends on where you are. Um, but And also, this is from 1950 to 2010, so it doesn't take into account recent data because uh, it can change based on uh, different uh, atmospheric properties and stuff. So no question on that, but it's interesting to look at nonetheless. Okay, tornado strength. So unlike hurricanes, we do not have, we do not measure the tornado strength by wind speed. Uh, so usually it's, they're not going to pass over like a weather station or close to a weather radar and it's too dangerous to go in there and like try to measure the wind speed. Like you will become the debris and, uh. Dorothy from Twister never really caught on. Well, don't say that to, uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was invented by my professor last semester. Howie Bluestein, uh, Dr. Howard Bluestein in our department invented the real life Toto and it's in our department. So he, it didn't catch on because he said it's too dangerous. That's true. But uh, he did other things like invent a new uh, thermodynamics equation and stuff like that. Like Howie Bluestein's one of the best meteorologists on the face of the planet right now. So anyway, yeah, we don't measure, we don't go in and measure it. Uh, so instead we use the enhanced Fujita scale um, and it was based on uh, the, Fuji the Fujita scale developed by Ted Fujita and this re rates tornado intensity based on damage. Uh, yeah, so Ted Fujita was from uh, Japan and he was supposed to like go and have a, sp a speech in Nagasaki he was, like, a visiting professor. Like, he was, like, a student professor or something, like, graduate student. And uh, he couldn't go for some reason. And then that day, they dropped a nuke on Nagasaki. And so he became, like, a scientist that would measure the nuclear fallout and, like, the damage done by nukes. And then he he realized some stuff about meteorology and he messaged a pr he pay used all his money to come over to the United States. Well, he used all his money to buy a typewriter in English so he could type a letter to a professor from the University of Chicago and explain what he had found about the atmosphere. And that professor let him come over to Chicago and work under him uh, for a full ride and got like paid for it. So, that's how he came to the United States, and then he got a, he invented a damage scale based on the work that he did inspecting the damage from the nukes. So it's like, uh, he like would measure like the angles of the stuff that was damaged and stuff, and he created this scale to figure out how fast the wind speeds were moving based on what the damage looks like. So, yeah, they're rated by the maximum amount of damage that they do, and uh, they go out and rate it after the storm is over. Uh, so here's the damage scale. So, uh, and EF0 has like minor damage. You can see there's like some trees knocked over and stuff. Uh, EF1, like you get moderate damage, so it's like flip flipping the mobile home over, 
you can lose some of your roofing. Uh, EF2, like, you can really do some damage. Like, I think that people really under uh, underestimate, like, how much damage a, a tornado is. Like, an EF2 is considered a strong tornado. And even a weak tornado of an EF1 can flip over a mobile home. But, um, yeah, you can uh, toss a car with an EF2, and you can uh, just shift homes off of their foundation. Um... EF3 is where you get the severe damage, so entire stories of well-constructed homes are destroyed, significant damage done to large buildings, buildings with weak foundations are blown away, and trees begin to lose their bark. Yeah, so this is why you kind of stay downstairs. You can see this uh, building, like, completely lost its top floor. Um, EF4, this is extreme damage. Well-constructed homes are leveled, cars are thrown significant distances, Top story exterior walls of masonry buildings will likely collapse. Yeah, an EF4 tornado can pull grass out of the ground and pick up a train. Like, that's pretty severe. Um, EF5 is, like, damage, like, you could not even imagine. Like, pretty much everything is gone. Like, you're gonna flatten the area. Uh, well-constructed homes are completely swept away. Swept away. Steel reinforced concrete structures are uh, critically damaged. High rise buildings sustain severe structural damage. Trees are usually completely debarked and stripped and stripped of their branches and they're snapped. So yeah, it's bad. It's bad news. Uh, EF4, EF5, like you should be underground or in a uh, tornado shelter, but not good. Okay, we talked about this, uh, since, yeah, so, yeah, we talked about this, but, uh, you can have, like, EF4 damage or, like, stronger damage embedded within the tornado line. Uh, so, it, the tornado is rated off its maximum damage, so this is considered an EF4 tornado, but most of the time it was EF2, uh, but all that matters is that in one area it created EF4. Since 1950, only 59 tornadoes in the U.S. have been F5 or EF5 tornadoes. There's a list. And uh, since 2013, there have not been any. So, well, there were in 2013. That was the last one. Violent tornadoes account for only 1% of all tornadoes. Um, and most of those violent tornadoes are... So most of these 1% are EF4s. So EF5s only account point for 0.1% of tornadoes. So most tornadoes and tornado warnings that you have are not gonna be an EF5, and most of them are not gonna be an EF4. They're usually gonna be a weak tornado, which I mean, quote unquote, weak. Like, you can still like flip a mobile home or, a, you know. But uh, yeah. EF2 and EF3s are still nothing to sneeze at, like, the, those can cause significant damage and injure people, so, you know, you don't want to be, uh, upstairs and that, like, you want to be in a safe place. Um, violent tornadoes cause nearly 70% of all tornado-related deaths, so the 1% of tornadoes cause 70% of the deaths. Weak tornadoes account for 74% of all tornadoes, but only cause 4% of all deaths. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're inside of a structure in a weak tornado that is stable and, like, you're downstairs and stuff and away from the windows, you're probably going to be fine. Strong and violent tornadoes cause so many deaths because they usually travel much farther than weak to weaker tornadoes. This is true. So, they're longer lived and... Weak tornadoes usually, like, last minutes, so that's, like, you know, the average 10 minutes tornado. That's, like, especially true for weak tornadoes. But strong tornadoes can last tens of minutes to hours. So, for instance, like, that Kentucky tornado last year that was extremely powerful and did a bunch of damage, uh, it was rated as an EF4. We thought it was going to be rated as EF5, but they only gave it an EF4 rating. That tornado was on the ground for a very long period of time, like hours and hours, and so that gave it more of a chance to become an EF4. Um, strong and violent tornadoes are often wider, so combined this means they cover more area on the ground. Yeah, so like for instance that El Reno tornado that was 2.6 miles wide, 
like that's gonna do a lot more damage because you're wiping out an entire city off the map compared to like a weak tornado that's like if, you know 100 meters wide you know you're hitting a couple houses in the neighborhood strong and violent tornadoes also do much more intense damage to any structures in their path so they create more debris and then they can throw at longer distances so yeah like if your house gets hit by like a like it gets a couple shingles taken off and then the shingles run into somebody else's window like that's one thing but if you have like a tornado that's picking up a car or like a train and like throwing it into your house like that's gonna cause a lot more damage so here is a graph so this is average path length and width so we start at f0 so this is kilometers so like an an f0 it's like at most like a kilometer or so but then you get up to the f4s and uh you can see that the the path length goes up so these are those like uh what are they called whatever anyway uh there, there are uh, tornadoes that stay on the ground for a long time. So this one stays on the ground 40 to 50 kilometers on average. Like that's pretty significant. And then this is the path width. So you can see for the uh, F0, like it's like less than 50 meters. But for the F4, it's like 500 meters wide. Uh, so that's a pretty significant difference in how much damage and how long... Uh, Oh, I think it's called like a long track tornado. Yeah, so however long it stays on the ground and how wide it is, is like correlated with the amount of damage it's gonna do. So tornado strength, uh, so strong and violent tornadoes predominantly occur in the Great Plains with a bullseye in Oklahoma. Granted, this is from 1921 to 1995, and this does not include the April 2011 incident, which significantly impacted tornado climatology, uh, and questionably so because it was only uh, over the course of like three days. But yeah, so this bullseye looks different now just because of uh, that storm and other storms that have happened since. But you can see that there between 1921 and 1995, there were uh, more significant tornado days in Oklahoma, and there were more uh, violent tornado days in Oklahoma. So, location of tornadoes. So, there are two main regions where tornadoes, especially strong to violent uh, tornado swarms. So, you have the Great Plains, so this is Tornado Alley. And then you have the southeast, and this is called Dixie Alley. So tornadoes cause 70 to 100 deaths per year in the United States, and most of the deaths are caused by like flying debris, like debris missiles. So why are there so many more deaths across the southeast when compared to the Great Plains? Well, I can tell you, but I'm pretty sure it's going to say on the next slide. So um, I'll, I'll wait. I don't want to spoil it. Uh, the Great Plains experiences more tornadoes overall and more significant tornadoes than the Southeast. Uh, from Ashley in 2007. <laughs> so, again, this is from 2007, so before that huge uh, tornado outbreak. So, be wary of the dates on these. But it's not due to the tornado strength alone. Uh, so you can see that the tornado deaths are highest. Uh, this is... I mean, it kind of covers Dixie Alley. Dixie Alley kind of stretches from, like, central Mississippi up to north Alabama. But um, the most tornado deaths happened up in, like, nor north uh, Mississippi and north Alabama. Uh, but you can see that all of the tornadoes are kind of concentrated over Oklahoma and the stronger tornadoes um, up until 2007, according to Ashley. Um... Here's the reasons they list. So many tornadoes in the southeast occur overnight, which is different than what was presented earlier, but that's what I was saying, is that, yeah, a lot of the tornadoes in the southeast occur at nighttime. So a lot of people are asleep or they can't see the tornadoes. Um, it doesn't say this yet. It might say it in a future slide, but also a lot of the tornadoes in the southeast are rain-wrapped because it's so close to the ocean. So 
you have a lot of moisture. And so when a tornado becomes wrapped in rain, it becomes invisible to the human eye and uh, people aren't expecting it. Also, many of the tornadoes in the southeast occur in winter, like I was also saying, like that January tornado. So people don't really expect tornadoes in January, but honestly, they be- they should start because it happens all the time. A lot of people live in mobile homes and weak framed homes in the southeast, which can be easily destroyed and turned into life threatening debris. Unfortunately, a lot of people in uh, the deep south are uh, impoverished, and so it- and there's not any places where they can evacuate to that are safer than their home. Well, I mean, if I lived in a mobile home and there was a tornado risk, I'd I'd rather go lie in a ditch. Not that I'm encouraging that, but you know, I would not want to be in a mobile home. But a lot of people don't know that, and so they uh, stay in their mobile home and it can cause uh, tornado deaths. Also, there's greater population density than in the Great Plains. True. Um, there's more trees. Yeah, so in Mississippi, there's this thing called the Pine Belt, which there's just a ton of pine trees. I never went storm chasing in Mississippi, and I probably never will, because there are so many trees that you just can't see anything. And also, the trees snap and, like, create debris missiles, so it's just not good. Moist air from the Gulf of Mexico causes tornadoes to be rain-wrapped and hard to see. Yeah, so, uh, high precipitation supercells. And then the storm motion is much faster in the southeast. Okay. Great. So, we just talked about tornadoes, and we talked about the time of year, and the time of day they happen, and the strength, and the location. So, let's talk about different types of tornadoes. So, there's two types of tornadoes. So there's non-supercell tornadoes, which are also called land spouts, and they're typically weaker and they don't form from supercells. So there's the land spout, and then a supercell tornado is much stronger because it forms from the organized structure of the supercell. So there is a uh, tornado. That is a really nice picture. I wish I took that picture. I would not want to be that truck, though. Like, bro, you better get out of there. Anyway. Uh, supercell tornadoes uh, are much more organized because they have this upwards mesocyclone, whereas land spouts are formed more from, like, converging boundaries and stuff like that. Okay, land spouts form under developing clouds with only updrafts, so they're ordinary thunderstorms, multi-cell clusters, MCSs, etc. They're not supercells. They are tornadoes, but they're not supercells. So they can cause some damage, but usually they're not destructive. And they oftentimes lack a visible funnel. Like, you can see the funnel almost becomes invisible in this storm, but it's pulling up this dust, so you're able to see it. This is also a very beautiful photograph. I wish I took photos like this. I go out storm chasing, and I don't ever see anything, and then I take pictures on my iPhone. Um, anyway, uh, I did see my first tornado this summer, but I didn't even get a picture of it. Anyway, but I saw it. I'm pretty sure... Anyway, I'm, I'm off topic. So, they can cause some damage, but they're usually not too destructive, and they lack a visible funnel. So, uh, like tornadoes, though, they must be touching the ground, and they must be connected to the cloud above to be considered a uh, land spout. So, you have to have that ground-to-cloud contact. And you can tell that they're touching the ground by the debris they kick up. So, they have this smooth tube-like experience, um, appearance, so they're more, they're more of like a tube, they're not like the big fat wedge, and normally you don't see it on a radar, because, uh, the parent storms aren't rotating, so they don't have that mesocyclone, and that mesocyclone is what you see on the radar when you detect that rotation. So, let's go over the land spout, uh, formation, so you have this little storm, it's like cute, like this little cloud, and it moves over pre-existing vertical vorticity at the surface. So you can get this vertical vorticity, like if the wind is moving faster here and slower here, or they're moving in opposite directions, like you can get it to spin that way. And then once it gets over this pre-existing vertical vorticity, uh, the updraft starts to stretch. So it starts spinning and that stretches it out. And then the stretching narrows the column, and so it kind of like creates a cycle where the vertical vorticity is increased. So you get stretching, and then more vorticity, and eventually it forms a land spout. 
And the only thing that matters in this process is the updraft. Um, and then eventually they weaken and dissipate as the parent cloud move away from this enhanced vorticity. So it just moves, so basically what happens is you have a storm and it moves over an area where the wind is spinning and it creates like a little brief tornado-like thing and then it moves away from that and then it goes away. Supercells, on the other hand, we went over the supercell tornado formation and it's quite complex. Um, as any tornado that forms from a supercell is a supercell tornado. They're usually bigger and more destructive than land spouts with stronger rotation and wind speeds. And they often have large wedge shape appearance, appearances and rough edges. So yeah, this is, I don't know if this can be called a wedge yet. I mean, it's getting there, but um, yeah, you have like this, like, you see this like nasty stuff coming down. This is called scud. So you, they look like kind of rough around the edges because it's got like these scud clouds coming down. Supercell tornadoes form near the boundary between the rear flanking downdraft and the rotating updraft. So yeah, we were talking about the rear flanking downdraft and the updraft. So this is where the tornado would form. It kind of forms at the boundary between the two, but technically it forms in the updraft. So it doesn't form in the middle of the rotating updraft though. It forms uh, in the boundary between the two. Like it forms within this notch, like inside the hook. The rising motion in the updraft does stretch and strengthen vertical vorticity, but not enough to get a tornado. It's only enough to get the mesocyclone. So we talked about the tilting. So you have this horizontal vorticity and it tilts and it moves up and it creates the uh, mesocyclone. So it goes from horizontal to vertical vorticity, but this doesn't create, create the intense vertically oriented rotation next to the surface that is needed for a tornado. The vorticity at the surface is mostly horizontal. So yeah, so it's mostly like this, like this tube, and most of it isn't shifted into the vertical. The rear flanking downdraft, located on the edge of the updraft, is necessary to generate strong vertically oriented rotation at the surface. So um, the tilting of horizontally oriented rotation sharply into the vertical, yeah. Yeah, I think we went over this. So, um, oh my gosh, this diagram, this could kill me. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so this is, these are the steps. This is from a paper by Markowski and Richardson in 2009, uh, which I spent a little bit too much time with. Anyway, here are the steps. So the first thing that happens is that the updraft tilts horizontal vorticity into the vertical. So we talked about that. Then the downdraft pushes these vortex lines, which are just streamlines of vorticity. So lines of constant vorticity. So there are lines of vorticity. They get pushed down onto the west side of the updraft. Okay, so it's between the updraft and the uh, rear flanking downdraft. So west side is where I'll show you here so this area right here this is the updraft and this is the downdraft so on the west side of this updraft like here you have vorticity that is pushed downwards uh by the rear flanking downdraft then vertical vorticity is brought to the surface and that's when the tornado forms so it's pushing it's vorticity infection it's pushing this vorticity from the top of the cloud uh, to the surface by between this updraft and the rear flanking downdraft. So right here, right here at the star, vorticity is pushed from the top of the atmosphere, not the top of the atmosphere, from the mid-levels, I guess, to the surface. Like it goes from the cloud to the surface. That's complicated, yeah, and it's also a theory, so they don't know for sure, this is just what they think. Um, but we're working on this problem, we're, we're working on this problem at OU, but the takeaway is that mesocyclones are formed by horizontal vorticity at the surface in an updraft, and then tornadoes are brought, formed by horizontal vorticity at the surface and an updraft and the RFD. So, 
mesocyclones form from these first two and you need a mesocyclone and when you take that rotation from the mesocyclone and you pull it down to the surface from that rear flanking downdraft that's when you get the tornado supposedly that's what they think so the best way to verify that the tornado is happening is via a report from a trained sp storm spotter questionable because storm spotters a lot of them just will report anything as a tornado and it'll just be like this piddly little cloud that's coming down and they're like oh a tornado because they want to report it so bad so anyway but it is a good way to verify it is uh sightings yeah however storm spotters are very fairly spot sparse not in oklahoma and can be non-existent in low population areas yeah, I could see that, but P storm chasing is so popular now, especially here. It's like, you can't get away from these storm spotters. It's like their hobby, like their weekend activity. And, you know, I'm no better. I don't report the tornadoes. Well, I would if I saw one and nobody else was around. But there are a lot of storm spotters in Oklahoma, so you won't really have that problem here. Meteorologists typically typically use radar to identify rotating storms and potential tornadoes. Yes, and we talked about this. So a lot of tornadoes, instead of being spotter confirmed, they will be radar confirmed. So tornadoes on radar. So we talk we talked some about this. Uh, two features that meteorologists look for on radar to identify potentially tornadic storms. They forgot the velocity thing because we do look for rotating velocity, but we already talked about that. But the two things the hook echo and the debris ball. So these are the two main things to find if there's going to be a tornado. So hook echo, so this shape right here looks like a fish hook and the debris ball, which is like looking for correlation coefficients to see if there's debris falling. So here's the hook echo. So it's a hook like appendage on the back of a supercell. It indicates a rotating mesocyclone. This doesn't indicate a tornado but if you have a rotating mesocyclone, it's a good indicator that a tornado may soon occur or is occurring. So if you see something like this on a radar, you can see they put a big red box here. They also put a pink box, which means that a spotter saw it. But if, if they didn't have a spotter out here, they would just put a red box anyway, because they look at this and they're like, hmm, that's probably a tornado or like could form one. So they'll just put a box anyway. Then your debris ball. So it's a region of very high reflectivity on the end of the hook echo, so it does indicate a tornado. I usually look at the correlation coefficient um, option because that shows the orientation of the debris and so you can see if it's falling. And if you have falling debris, that means that you have a debris ball. So yeah, that's usually what people use, but I guess you can also use reflectivity. But you know, like this might be hail, but honestly, since there's not as much hail in here, uh, yeah, I guess that's a good way to see. Like if you have more reflectivity in the rear flanking downdraft, that's probably a debris ball. Anyway, debris ball, important. It indicates a tornado and it's because debris is lofted in the air, it's picked up by the tornado and it's large, so it reflects a lot of energy back to the radar. It shows up as pinks, purples, and even white on radar. Yeah, so you can see there's really high DBZ, and it doesn't really match up. Like, it's higher DBZ back here than it is in the forward flanking downdraft. And you would expect the forward flanking downdraft to have more reflectivity than the rear. So you can see, because there's more reflectivity in the rear, there's it's probably mixed in with other things. So there's probably a tornado here. The debris ball is much smaller than the hook echo. So this is the whole hook echo right here. And the debris ball is just a little thing inside of it. So the hook echo denotes the mesocyclonic rotation and the debris ball denotes the tornado. So tornadoes are much smaller than mesocyclones. And debris balls don't occur with every tornado, but only large ones that loft lots of debris. And also they have to go over a place with lots of debris. Because if you're out in the middle of nowhere, there's not really that much to pick up. But if you're going through a city or a forest or something like that, it's a lot easier to pick up debris. So you can also use velocity radar to just to find the rotating winds. Um, but we already talked about that. So you just look for red on blue. Well, red on green if you're using most apps. But the red on blue is what we used. And um, 
we call this a TVS or a tornado vortex signature. But you have to know where the radar is because you could mistake a downburst or divergence for a tornado. So you need to know whether it's rotating counterclockwise or if it is just divergence. Okay, and we'll go back over this again. So over here, tornado or downburst. So this is the radar. This blue right here is incoming and this is outgoing. So look at this motion. This is counterclockwise motion here. You want this counterclockwise motion to indicate that there is a mesocyclone. Yeah, so counterclockwise motion. Tornado. Well, tornado vortex signature. There might not even be a tornado. Anyway, a TBS tells us that a tornado is likely to occur or already occurring. And this is located at the tip of the hook echo, co-located with a debris ball, if the debris ball is present. So the stronger this is, like if you can get this really tight and like these values to be brighter, like that means that it's stronger rotation. Yeah, so here's one on radar. So you have this hook echo here. This is in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, on that fateful day, April 27, 2011, the super outbreak. So um, this is the debris ball right here. So you can see it's really pulling that in. Like, it's pulling it in. Um, so I guess the tornado would be like here. Yeah. It's just so strong that it's pulling the rear flanking downdraft all the way here, but it is a hook. And um, this is a really strong tornado probably, but you can see this is the rotation. Um, so I guess the, ro the radar is like over here. Is this a, where's the radar? Yeah, this is the Birmingham radar. So Birmingham is over, like this is Tuscaloosa and stuff. Birmingham is like over here. It's like off this map. Um, it's over to the east. So this means it's outgoing here and it's incoming here. So it's going like this. So counterclockwise flow. Oh, they have a, a dot where the radar is. Yeah. Okay. So Frederick, Oklahoma. I've been here several times. Um, not much out there, but you know, we love Frederick. Anyway, this is in 2015. This is where the Frederick radar is. So you've got the hook, good. You have a little debris ball and um, this is outgoing and this is incoming. So it's again, rotating counterclockwise. So good. Hastings, Nebraska. Okay, the radar's up here. And again, you have the hook. This is incoming and this is outgoing. So outgoing, incoming, outgoing, incoming. So. There's no obvious debris ball here because it's not higher reflectivity, but you do have this rotation here, which looks pretty good. So, but I, uh, I'm assuming that this is, it says TVS imagery. I'm assuming that these are tornadoes. Okay. So here is some material that's optional um, and some of these videos like might be uncomfortable to watch because they're videos of actual tornadoes there's not they're not going to be information on this in the quiz or the test and you can watch it on your own time if you feel like it but uh they're interesting so this was the april 27 2011 tornado this is james Spann, living legend he went to my undergrad so i like him even more and i went to this anime convention in birmingham and he was there and he went and talked to everybody at the anime convention anyway he, he broadcasts for like the southern portion of, uh, like from Birmingham South, pretty much like that's his region. And uh, he is like so good at forecasting. He was up on TV like forecasting and he was self-taught and they're like, sir, I think you probably need to go get a degree, but like you're really good. And so he was like, okay. And he just went and got a degree, even though he was like already nominated as the best. Uh, TV meteorologist. Anyway, here's him, and he's like, really, he had to get to work because there were a lot of tornadoes in Alabama that day. And he also is good at his uh, geographic locations and stuff. That's why it's important and why uh, you should memorize locations of where you're forecasting for. So if you want to watch this, here's the video. 
And then here's another video. This is from May 20th, 2013. This is Damon Lake in Oklahoma City, or Damon Lane. So this was um, a very uh, deadly tornado. And this was another video. It's Lessons from El Reno. And that was that really wide tornado that was 2.6 miles wide and that several chasers died uh, from. Due to, it was human error as well. Uh, they died because I think they weren't wearing seatbelts and they were chasing on a dirt road without an exit plan. You don't ever chase on a dirt road and you definitely should wear a seatbelt. So they were ejected from their vehicles and it's very sad. Um, a lot of lessons were learned. Okay, that's all for today. So I know it's a little dark, but you can watch these videos if you're interested in that kind of thing. There's also other videos online. Um, yeah, no quiz material on this specific uh, PowerPoint, but the other two PowerPoints there will be quiz material from.